We do have a great group of folks joining us to talk about the campus of the future, so let's meet them right now. First, we have Daryl Rosser. He is CEO of Sagus International, headquartered in Chicago, Illinois. Mr. Rosser's company co-sponsored the July Symplo Symposium, along with our South Carolina State Department of Education. Then next to Amanda is Ray Rogers, who is the superintendent of Dillon School District 2. Also joining us from Chicago is architect Steve Turks with the firm of Perkins and Will. Next we have Diane Sumter, a former State Board of Education member and president of DESA Incorporated. David Hu, a nationally renowned futurist and author, has also made the trip from Chicago to join us here this evening. And finally with us is Dr. Oscar Loveless, who is a rural family physician practicing in Newberry County. Mr. Hull, I know that uh, your focus is on the future and um, looking ahead um, into the future of education, why do you think that there is such a need uh, for us to build schools of the 21st century? Um, well, when you look forward, you also have to look back. And, and so if you think about it, the school in Dillon and most of the schools in the United States of America initially came about in the 1800s in the agricultural age. And it was the one-room school of Abraham Lincoln and they're small towns and one teacher taught a different group of kids and everybody got out in time to go work the farms and the whole school year was predicated on the agricultural rhythm of the country. And then when we became a, an industrial country, then we got centralized urban and the school became kind of like the factory, if you will. You know, there was a shift and there were bells and people moved from place to place. And then the information age came about in the latter part of the last century. And we kind of layered that model with uh, information of computers, language labs, videotape rather than the old film. And so here we are uh, with the school year that's based on farming with a building that's based on factory with technology that's already out of date and so here we are it's a perfect demarcation in the 21st century to say okay our schools are from the 20th century and the 19th century and the 18th century let's face the future and so that's really the context as far as i'm concerned is that is is we know the model is broken and it's based on the past so the only way we can create something of true value for the children of Dillon, for the children of South Carolina and the United States, is to just face forward. If I could jump in on that, <clears throat> that's how I got involved with uh, <clears throat> Daryl and Sagus, is there was no real research when we looked at it that correlated classroom design and learning outcomes. And we knew ergonomics and flexibility, but there was no real research. So what I thought was so profound, what Daryl did was to take, to make a commitment rather than putting the name of a, bil uh, of a company on a building, to put the, the name of a company into creating the intellectual property about finding out how classrooms could be better designed. And then as he's shown in J.V. Martin and also in Chicago, doing, making sponsors of social action, actually taking action, going in, and making it happen, and then measuring the results. And that's an entirely different way of, of corporate involvement. And you know, what, what I was struck when I heard um, Dr. Lovelace's uh, comments at the symposium, because I hadn't thought about this, was how, how uh, the community needs to be involved. You're talking about from a medical point of view, and I was just thinking about the building and the pedagogy and the, and the technology. So I was really pr profoundly affected by what you had to say on that. I know, Mr. Hull, you talk a lot to CEOs right. and presidents of companies. Do you agree with Daryl that it's good for um, private partners to come on board in a project like this? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's it's the future of America. I mean, if we if we don't if we don't change the educational system in the United States of America, um, we're not going to be the United States of America that we all think we are in 15 or 20 years. And and you know there. 15, 20 years made me think of something that Dr. Rex said that I had never thought of until that symposium. He said, if we took the knowledge that we know about child development from birth through age five and fully implemented that into pre-K school, we could, we could transform this country in one generation. So that's what we're talking about. And, and, and whether it's corporate, whether it's academic, whether it's medical, Everybody stands to lose if we don't do this. And I, when I talk to CEOs, they always talk, often talk about, I should say, uh, how even graduates of college are not prepared for the workplace. Mm -hmm. Somehow they've managed to skate through and not have a, 
an awareness of what they need to do and how they need to act and, and the intelligence that they need to be contributors in the, in the, in the society. So it, it's, but it's business is self-interest without question. Now, David, if you could tell us one thing uh, that you would not want us to leave out as we're doing the programming and planning for this School of the Future, what would that be? <laughs> <laughs> I would say if you think you know what the answer is because of current best practices, that's probably not the answer. In other words, if it exists today, it's not for the future. And if you look back to find best practices and bring them forward, you're just perpetuating the past, even if it might be the right past. So I th the largest context I would give would be this context, which is um, when, when Socrates was talking to Plato, Plato wanted to write down what Socrates said. And Socrates didn't like that because Socrates said, if you write down knowledge, nobody will learn it. You have to speak it, hence the Socratic method, right? Mm -hmm. Then when Gutenberg invented the movable type press, everyone says, oh, you can't learn through reading unless you, you have to learn by writing, all the scribes said. And now I think we're at one of these places where we all talk about how our kids don't read and all this. We may be at one of those new kind of inflection points, I don't know what it's called, screening or something, where, where knowledge is gonna be consumed in a, in a multi-sensorial way that we can't quite comprehend. Certainly people of our relative age on this stage tonight, <laughs> right? We have to look to our, our children. So, so I would just say keep everything open and look around for the present and try and project it into the future. Mr. Hull, would you like to add something? Well, as a futurist, my job is to get people to think about the future. And I do that by traveling all around the world, talking and writing and advising. And so I, I thank Daryl because for the first time I'm, I'm putting so-called rubber to the road because I believe that, that what is starting here is one of the most important things for this country and for the planet, if you will, is to re-energize, reinvent, recreate, transform education. And so, so I'm happy to be a theoretician, if you will, or a forward thinker who's actually participating in doing something that is really wonderful, essential, necessary, and as Steve said, is going to go way beyond Dylan. Dylan's the first step, and that's what's so great, is Dylan's going to be the first place.